So thank you. Thanks for the thanks to the academy to uh, for having me here as a fellow. My pleasure, my honor. Uh, so I'd like to weave a story from calculus to number theory. Uh, after all the fancy science talks we have been hearing, I'm going to just play around with something very. Uh, you can't. Uh, you can't hear. Very good. In fact, maybe it was a giveaway when I asked, "Can you hear me?" No one said anything. Or can you hear me now? People in the back. Okay. So, well, numbers, uh, another word, integers. I want to start with a favorite, uh, favorite quote of mine. Uh, Die ganzen Zahlen hat der Liebe Gott gemacht, alles andere ist Menschenwerk. This is uh, a quote attributed to uh, the great German uh, number theorist Kronecker. That's Kronecker for you. Uh, and uh, if you're unfamiliar, unfamiliar with German, uh, it means God made the integers, all else is the work of man. But I guess it literally translates to the set of all integers was made by our dear God. Everything else is man's work. Well, those are integers, and traditionally in mathematics, uh, you see the letter Z uh, to denote the set of all integers, and that is because of uh, the great German tradition and you know the die Zahl and that that word stands for numbers. Okay, so the story I want to uh, I kind of give you some idea of has uh, two historical. Uh, starting points. One, both of them, in fact, uh, coincidentally start from the 14th century. So here is a 14th century theorem for you. This involves numbers. If you take uh, what's called the harmonic series, which is just the sum of the reciprocals of all the odd, of all the integers, positive integers, fact of life, this diverges to infinity. So this fact was first realized uh, uh, several centuries ago. And what does this mean, diverges to infinity? This means that given any number, m, however large, you can add sufficiently many terms and make this larger than m. That's what it means to say uh, the series diverges to infinity. This was first proved by a uh, French philosopher, Nicole Arem. And in fact, his proof is also the simplest proof. Actually, it's, uh, you just need some high school, uh, maybe not even high school. Well, you got the one, you got a half, one, one third and one fourth. Well, both, both of them are at least one fourth. So if you add them up, that's at least twice of one fourth, which is a half again. And then you take the next four terms, all of them are at least one eighth, four times one eighth is a half again. So you see infinitely many halves building up. And so clearly I can make it larger than any given number m. This was Orem's proof. Well, too bad, this series diverges. I want to make this something finite. I want to make it converge. Well, you make these terms uh, go down to zero a little faster. Uh, so this leads us to consider a series like this, the sum of reciprocals of squares of integers. This, uh, uh, it's easy to see that it's finite, it converges. A quick proof that you might uh, see in calculus books is to compare this series with the integral of one or x squared from one to infinity, and it's a trivial exercise to see that that's finite. Well, what does it converge to? What is that finite quantity? I mean, is it, is it two? Is it, it's kind of easy to see that this whole thing is at, at most two, it's less than two. But what is it? This problem uh, went by the name the Basel problem. It was apparently first posed by an Italian, uh, Mengoli. And it was unsuccessfully but very famously attacked by the Bernoulli family, who are based in Basel, and hence the Basel problem. Uh, people like Leibniz could not sum this series until a kid in his 20s, uh, in 1730s, actually summed this series. Uh, there's the kid. Uh, you recognize the kid? <laughs> well, he's not a kid here. It's a portrait when he was an older man, Euler. So there's Lenny Euler for you. Uh, and it's one of the beautiful formulas of mathematics that the sum of reciprocals of squares of integers actually sums up to pi squared by 6. There's something impossibly beautiful about this. Uh, you might ask me what are applications. There, there are applications. Apparently, it shows up in discrete Hilbert transform and so on. But forgetting any application, it's just very beautiful. You know, what, on the left-hand side is all these integers. And right-hand side, circumference, diameter, what has pi got to do with this? So to me, this is. Uh, uh, yeah, like I said, it's just, it's like a, it's a gem, it's like a diamond. And there's a very delightful book, uh, maybe you would like to do some bedtime reading with this, it's called A Journey Through Genius, Great Theorems of Mathematics, published by Penguin. Uh, every chapter is one great theorem and a great soul who really worked on this, and one chapter is about Euler and this formula of Euler. Let me go to the other uh, historical uh, sort of line of thought, uh, which will ultimately get weaved into the story of mine. Uh, this is a similar looking uh, series, except it's now it's got some negative signs. It alternates. The signs are alternating. I'm looking at 
reciprocals of odd positive integers, but with alternating signs. I got one, then I subtract one third, and then add one fifth, then I subtract, add, add, add. It's kind of easy to see that this kind of converges somewhere. The question again is, what does it converge to? And uh, this again, it's uh, converges to the number pi by four. This was, uh, we should be, feel happy and be proud of the fact that this was first proved uh, in India. Uh, by Madhava, and if you visit Isa Pune, we have our maths colloquium room is named after Madhava now. Uh, and later, uh, it was proved also by Leibniz and Gregory. In calculus books, often because of the Eurocentric way of uh, how knowledge has been uh, packaged, uh, you would often uh, see this called as Leibniz series, but now if you Google this, you will see many places Madhava Leibniz series. Uh, technically, it's, I suppose one should call this Madhava Leibniz Gregory. And if you uh, quick proof uh, tangent inverse of x, this is a good looking function. You can expand this, it's smooth, it's infinitely differentiable. There's some expansion of this type. Uh, and if you plug in x equals one, you know that the angle for which tangent of some angle is one is pi by four. So that's that pi by four there. So these two formulae, uh, Euler's formula and uh, Madhava, these I want to make this case that these are actually prototypical examples of a very beautiful area of number theory, uh, which goes by this name, special values of L functions. Okay, so what's this? What's an L function? Now, it's very difficult to define what's an L function, but one can recognize an L function when one sees one. And the first example to know is the Riemann zeta function. So that's the Riemann zeta function. Uh, and you see the relation to Euler. It's, you think of this as a function of the, that parameter S. And Riemann studied this function in a landmark paper in uh, 1859. And he studied this function to see how primes are distributed. Among the set of all integers, I look at those which are primes. You know, 2, 3, 5, 7, there's a prime. 9 is not a prime because 9 is 3 times 3. Uh, so you want to see how primes are distributed. And Riemann had this uh, idea that he should study this function. And you know, Riemann died very young. Uh, he was uh, within 40 years. He, if you look at Riemann's collected works, it's just this much. And every paper he wrote just led to an entire area of mathematics. He just wrote one paper in number theory. So in this era where there's, we talk a lot about writing lots of papers, you know, few insightful papers is. Ah, sorry, yeah, one of the, uh, maybe it's 1866. Thank you, sorry. Uh, so Euler's formula in the language of uh, Riemann would be uh, the value of this function at two sum sub to pi squared by six. And it's kind of amazing. It's in the nature of things that even though zeta two, the sum of reciprocals of squares of integers sum sub to pi squared by six, but if I take the sum of reciprocals of cubes of integers, all one can say is it's irrational. You know, is it pi cube times, okay, it's, you can prove it's not pi cube times irrational, but you know, is it like the number e or you know, e plus pi? No one knows. So it is in the nature of things more generally that zeta, this value at even integers is well understood, whereas its values at odd positive integers is a total mystery. Yeah. And this other uh, Madhava's uh, example is, uh, becomes a special case of a family of L functions uh, called Dirichlet L functions. You take an integer and I look at all those which are relatively prime to this given integer n. And you take a homomorphism, never mind that word. It just means that for every relatively integer relatively prime to n, I take some complex number. Uh, and then you cook up uh, a function of this kind. And Dirichlet looked at these, uh, uh, this function to prove that there are infinitely many primes and arithmetic progressions. So for example, sir, can you give me an integer? Just some large integer, anyone. <laughs> pick, pick an integer. 17. 17. How do you prove there are infinitely many primes which leave the remainder 1 upon dividing by 17? Yeah, this is not a trivial exercise. Uh, maybe 17 one can handle by some elementary number theory arguments, but if you say it's a 2016 or some large, so one needs a certain systematic way of uh, addressing, you know, answering or proving such uh, statements. And Dirichlet studied an L function, a function like this to prove infinitude of primes and arithmetic progressions. There is Dirichlet and people say that Dirichlet denoted this as L because his first name starts with an L and somehow tradition has stuck and this, that's all. That's where the uh, L functions come from. And Madhava's formula may be stated as if I look at, take N to be four, well, what are the integers relatively prime to four? That are just odd integers. And so they're just, you know, the one and three are the only odd integers modulo four. And if I want to represent them as complex numbers, I take for one, I take one, and for three, I take minus one. That would be the non-trivial character. 
what do those words mean? And then this series will become 1, and that becomes a 0, 1 minus 103 to this, plus 105 to this, minus 107 to this, and so on. And Madhava's formula would be stated as the value of this Dirichlet function at 1 is pi by 4. And so, more generally, what are L functions? Well, there are all kinds of objects that people want to study in mathematics. And many of these objects you can study by studying some sequence that this object might determine. For example, think of a function and its Fourier, uh, Fourier coefficients. Or maybe I want to solve an equation. I, I take an equation like y squared equals x cubed plus ax plus b. I want to solve this in integers. Well, maybe that's too hard. So I try to solve it modulo prime, so modulo prime powers. And I package that sequence of numbers into a function of this kind. And a general principle in number theory is if I want to study that object, well, that spits out the sequence. And to study the sequence, I, I study this function. And then the basic problems would be, well, I want to study this function as a function of the variable s. And then I look at special values of this function for plugging in s equals something or the other. And that typically gives you some kind of structural information about that object m. So this is like a general principle that people, uh, is a general principle. So for example, Dirichlet's theorem about infinitude of primes boils down to proving that the value at 1 is non-zero. So Madhava's formula that something L1 chi was pi by 4, pi by 4 is non-zero, pi is not zero, proves that there are infinitely many primes which are 1 modulo 4, infinitely many primes that are 3 modulo 4, and in fact, there are equal number of infinities, so to speak. So all this follows from this innocuous little statement about this particular function. This makes a beautiful uh, theorem for, for a course in analytic number theory, and likewise, uh, if you know such words, I take the dedicate zeta function of a number field and its value at 1 gives you information about the number field, about class numbers and so on. This makes a very nice course in algebraic number theory. This could be the culminating theorem in the course. So now let me jump to current times. Uh, the Langlands program. The Langlands program in the 1960s, this great mathematician Robert Langlands came up with this web of conjectures which uh, sort of related different areas of mathematics. There's Bob Langlands. Uh, yeah, so he's about 80 now. You certainly have heard of Einstein. He's a man who, has, uh, who uses Einstein's office for the last 30 years. He's at the Institute. So the basic idea which connects these different areas in the Langlands program, all these areas, is the idea of an L function. So maybe you came across the celebrated theorem of Andrew Wiles in the 90s. It's one of those rare mathematical theorems which made it to the first page of the New York Times. Uh, Andrew Wiles' theorem very uh, shortly can be stated as every elliptic curve is modular. Elliptic curve is something is an object in algebraic geometry. To that, one says it's modular. That means there's some object in this world of harmonic analysis and representation theory. And this connecting bridge is to this I attach an L function, to that I attach an L function, and these L functions are equal. And this, what I just described, takes about 100 pages in the Annals of Mathematics to prove. Uh, this is Wiles' theorem. He proved this to prove Fermat's last theorem. So. So this was, uh, uh, in, I guess in modern number theory, there are L functions which come out of this area called the Langlands program. And I want to, a take home message is, you know, this is somehow like the grand unifying principle in the world of mathematics. And the idea of an L function is very central to this, uh, to this entire, this web of conjectures. And now I want to give you a glimpse into uh, a couple of theorems of mine. So here's a theorem uh, I've had the pleasure of proving with my colleague, Bhaskar. And this is going to appear in the American Journal. Uh, OK, so now there are words I haven't defined. There's no way I can define this in a talk like this. Let sigma be a cuspidal automorphic representation of GLN or a number field. Now, there's a poetic way of describing what these objects are. And in fact, Langlands and many others in the Langlands program have waxed eloquent about this poetic way of expressing. These, for mathematicians, are like the elementary particles are for physicists or are for scientists. They are some of the building blocks i.e., given a mathematical object, there's an L function. This L function is built up from the L functions attached to these kind of uh, elementary particles. And then what we did is we identified a couple of numbers, complex numbers, called periods, uh, so that some kind of an L function divided by, if you know such words, this is the adjoint L function, divided by these periods is algebraic. Now, this statement is the analog that if I take the sum of reciprocals of integers, that was the value of 2 of the Riemann zeta function. Zeta 2 was pi squared by 6. This theorem is of the type that zeta 2 divided by some mysterious number, like pi squared, is 1 over 6. Well, I can't really put my hands on 1 over 6, but I can say so much that it's algebraic. Algebraic is a little more, algebraic means a number is algebraic if it satisfies, if it's the root of a polynomial, like, like square root of 2 is algebraic. Yeah. Pi is not. And more generally, we then looked at, well, zeta 2 by pi squared is rational. What rational number is that? 
and uh, we identified, we looked at primes which divide this rational number. I'll be done in another minute, I assure you. Uh, and we proved that if a prime divides this algebraic number, this is a congruence prime, meaning there's some other elementary particle of the same kind. These two are unequal, but somehow modulo primes are equal. That's Bhaskar. Uh, and a quick glimpse into another theorem, uh, which is brand new. It's work in progress, which Andrashil, I take another elementary particle of a different kind. And to that, there are certain L functions which are attached. And we proved that if I look at values, successive values, they differ by algebraic quantities. Compare this with zeta 2 was pi squared by 6, but zeta 3 is a mystery. So their successive values, it's very difficult to compare them. But in this situation, we are able to prove that uh, you know, the successive values differ only by algebraic quantities. There's Chandrashil, and thank you. Let's go for lunch.